Hey, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you and uh, welcome to online church again. Um, but regardless of where we're at and what we're doing right now, um, we're connected through the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Christ, um, regardless of where we're meeting together or meeting separate. Let's open this morning with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are in our lives and just all the good that you do. And Father, this morning we are here to proclaim how good you are to us, to worship and lift up your name. And Father, I pray that no matter where we're worshiping from this morning or who we're with, that we would take this time and concentrate on you. And that, Father, we would worship you in spirit and truth, that we would hear your voice. And Father, I just pray that you would bind us together through your Holy Spirit. We pray that we'd be able to be back to, uh, together soon. Um, but God, just thank you for who you are this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start off this morning with a few worship songs. Um, so wherever you're at or whoever you're with, you can listen or sing along. Um, but let's worship God this morning.
Heavenly Father, as we join you in worship, Lord, just let us reflect on the sacrifice of your Son, what he has done for us in dying on the cross, what you have done for us for raising from the dead, for saving us. Lord, just you are worthy and holy and worthy of praise. Lord, let this be a special time. Um, while we're separated, let us be apart. Uh, while we're separated, let us be together in spirit. Lord, just bless Pastor Kevin as he brings a message. Um, and just strengthen us, embolden us, and make us your church in this valley and wherever we're watching today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles and want to follow along on the reading this morning, we'll be in John chapter 15. And um, as we begin, I just want to uh, update us on a few things that will be happening. Um, so the governor did announce that things will start lifting this coming week. Um, so stay tuned uh, this week. I'll be sending out an email in the next couple of days that's going to outline our plan going forward. Um, just kind of waiting to hear um, back from all the board and get feedback. And uh, we're working on a plan um, for us to be able to begin meeting together again. Um, so keep out uh, a look for that email. Um, we'll be sending that out soon. Um, this week, we're going to continue as we have been. Uh, Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., I'll be doing a live devotional here on Facebook Live. And then Wednesday night, we're going to continue doing the Zoom Bible study on the book of James. Um, and that will be uh, myself, the pastor from Grangeville Nazarene and Orfino Nazarene um, together. And I'll be sending out the link to that in the email as well. And um, we just uh, once again, I uh, want to ask you to um, continue to prayfully consider um, your giving during this time. Um, the church does have expenses. And um, you know, thank you all. Um, we've gotten a lot of stuff coming in. So thank you for those who have been faithful to that. Um, but continue to prayfully consider um, what God would have you to give during this time. And once again, um, if you are watching, um, put a like or a comment on this. Um, just let us know you're there. Um, it does me a lot of good um, to know that there are people watching. Um, I like seeing the comments and the likes. I know just say good morning and let everyone else know you're there as well. Um, and I, once again, man, I, I miss seeing more people in the pews. Um, and I hope to see you all very, very soon. Well, this week we are wrapping up the I Am series. Over the past several weeks, we've been going through the seven I Am's of John, where seven times Jesus makes an I Am statement. And I don't know about you, but man, I feel like this theme has fit so, so well for the time that we're in. That during a time like this, we need reminded of who Jesus is and who, who he is to us and who we need to be looking towards. And so, you know, I usually plan out stuff pretty far in advance. And when I planned this out, I had no idea what would be going on in the world. Um, but man, I feel like God has made it fit so, so well. Um, some words that we need to hear. And I think this week as we wrap up is a great reminder for us during this time. Um, so if you have your Bibles, John chapter 15, I'll read verses 1 through 11. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and the Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it becomes even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, 
that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you remain in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Father, we pray that you would speak through your word this morning. And I pray that wherever we're at, wherever we're listening from, Holy Spirit, that you would just speak. Open our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here, our I am statement for this morning is Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, when I hear something like that, I notice that um, he doesn't say, I am the vine, but he says that I am the true vine. And when I hear that statement, I think there must also be false vines. And this whole image of a vine is interesting and common over the history of Israel. So over and over again in the Old Testament, what you have is that God compares Israel to a vine or the vineyard of God. Um, In Isaiah 5, he says, the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. In Jeremiah 21, he says, I planted you as a choice vine. Ezekiel likens Israel to the vine. Um, And this is repeated over and over in scripture that Israel is likened to a vine. But what's interesting in the Old Testament is that it's never a good thing. Whenever God speaks of Israel as a vine, it's always that the vine has run wild, that the vine is degenerate. It's never a good thing picture when God calls out Israel as divine. Um, So then here's Jesus. He knows full well this history, and he has the audacity to look Jewish people in the eye and say, I am the true vine. It's as if Jesus said, you think that just because you belong to the nation of Israel, God's people, that you are part of me. That you're part of the true vine of God. But Jesus is saying the fact that you have this lineage doesn't mean you're actually part of God's people. It says the only thing that can save you is an intimate relationship with me. I am the true vine and branches must be joined to me. Jesus was laying it down that it's not heritage or your bloodline that is going to save you. That there is no external qualification that can set a man right with God. Only the friendship and close relationship with Christ can do that. And when Jesus repeats um, this himself, that I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me or abide in me, then you will bear fruit. You see that Jesus is talking to people who are very confident in their position simply because they were Jewish. They're very confident in a position before God because of who their ancestry was. And Jesus comes and puts that upside down and says, no, no, no. You need to be connected to the true vine. And I am the true vine. And like I said before, when I hear him say, I am the true vine, it, thinks, it makes me think that maybe there are false vines as well. And so I have to ask, what false vines might, me, might we be trying to tap into in order to bear fruit or receive salvation or to find significance or peace or happiness that is false? Sometimes Americans get just as caught up in our heritage as Jewish people do. Uh, I don't know how many times I've heard things like, well, of course I'm a Christian. I'm an American. Um, But what we need answered is not our nationality, our job title, our accomplishments. But do you know Christ and are you abiding in Christ, remaining in him? Are you staying connected to him? The secret of the life of Jesus was his contact with God, his constant relationship with the Father. And you see this, that over and over again, Jesus withdrew to a solitary place to meet with his father. We must keep in contact with Jesus. We cannot do that unless we take deliberate steps to remain in him. And, 
You know, once again, I'm amazed at the subject matter applying to us at a time like this. Because I've needed this. It's easy to look what's going on around us and shift our focus away from what truly matters. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Remain in me. So this morning, what does it mean for us to remain in Jesus if he is the true vine? Meaning that he's our source of what life is supposed to be. How do we do this? And, and how do we stay connected to where life truly comes from? Well, the biggest and obvious thing is we need to abide in Jesus. We need to abide in Jesus. In verse 4, he says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, but it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, we will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing if you do not remain in me. Now, I emphasize remain because how many times is remain repeated in that? Um, the interchangeable word that other versions use there is abide. The message is simple. We are to abide in Jesus. And to abide in Christ means that we continue in a permanent state of relationship with him or be in constant fellowship and relationship with him, that we maintain the connection. It is to make sure that wherever we go, no matter what we do or who we are with, we are remaining in fellowship with Christ. Jesus says it's like a branch. Um, th this is like a branch coming off the vine, that a branch has no power by itself. All of its resources, all of its strengths, its power, it comes from the vine. And if that branch loses connection to the vine, it loses all of those things. And Jesus says, this is what it is like in a relationship with me. When you are in me and I in you, you have everything you need and more. When you break connection with me, he says very plain and simple, apart from me, you can do nothing. So what does that mean? That apart from me, you can do nothing. Because in reality... We can do a lot of things apart from the vine. You can have a career. You can have a family. You can preach a sermon. You can make billions of dollars. You can climb Everest. You can put a man on the moon. We can do all these things under our own capacity to a certain point, and we can do them rather well. So what does Jesus say? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, there are a couple things that we can't do apart from Christ. One is save ourselves. And the other is produce fruit. Those are things that we cannot achieve under our own power. Well, let's look at fruit. We, we can't produce fruit unless we are connected to the vine. Branches cannot produce fruit on their own. I think that we're pretty good at trying to operate independently of Jesus Christ. We might look pretty good. We might feel successful and self-sufficient. We may even get good results. But how many of us go through life doing things entirely on our own strength, never pausing to depend on God's power? The truth is, we are completely incapable of producing fruit and pleasing God until we utterly depend on Jesus Christ. This is contrary to our human nature and what we're taught from a very young age in the world that we can be self-sufficient that you need to find an inner strength within yourself but when we choose jesus as lord and become a branch in his vine it must be our mission wherever we do wherever we go to live daily in his strength not our own we think that we have to perform and do all the right things for fruit to come but we can literally do nothing to bear fruit except abide. That's all we have to do to bear fruit. That's all we can do to bear fruit is abide. And I hope you see how freeing this is. That if we abide daily, moment by moment, the result of abiding is beautiful, life-giving fruit. We don't have to rely on our skill sets or our intellect or our keeping to perfection. We simply abide. We can't produce fruit by trying harder. 
We can't simply manufacture fruit by taking these steps. We can only bear fruit if we abide. That's the one thing we can do and must do. So how do we do this? How do we abide in Christ? Well, I like what William Barclay said. He said, For some few of us, abiding in Christ will be a mystical experience which is beyond words to express. But for most of us, it will mean a constant contact with him. It will mean arranging life, arranging prayer, arranging silence in such a way that there is never a day when we give ourselves a chance to forget him. I like that a lot. I heard about a missionary in Africa um, years ago who um, was living in a small hut, but they did have electricity to the hut and had some light bulbs hanging from the ceiling. Well, one day he um, had some people from a far distant remote village come and they were doing a Bible study together. And when night come, uh, the, the hut got dark and they flipped on the lights. And these villagers were amazed when the lights came on. They had never seen anything like it before. They looked at the light bulb and inspected it and were amazed at how this light just popped on at the flick of a switch. Well, when they left, one of the villagers asked if he could have one of the light bulbs. And the missionary gave it to him, said, sure, you can have one of the light bulbs. <clears throat> well, a few months later, that missionary went to this village and he entered this man's hut and saw that he had a light bulb hanging down from his hut just attached to a regular string. And so it was hanging there, and the man understood the general idea of the connection, but what he didn't understand was empowering, where the power came from. I think a lot of believers are like that today. They understand this principle a little bit, but they don't truly understand the concept of the power that comes from maintaining a connection with Jesus Christ. I think too many of us are like light bulbs hanging on a string. We look good, we look like we should work, but we are not connected enough to the source of power to actually shine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the vine that gives life and power. And your job is to abide in me, to remain in me. And if you do, you will bear much fruit. So let me ask, are you taking the time to abide in Christ? When we get busy and caught up in so many other different things, it's so easy to put God on the back burner. We can get involved with so many good things that we often lose sight of the most important thing. So I would encourage you to take a look at your schedule. How do you spend your time? And honestly ask yourself, am I abiding? And especially during this time um, that, you know, I've often said, I wish I had the time to do blank. Well, for a lot of us, we've had a lot of extra time on our hands. How have you used that time? Have you made sure you're connecting with Jesus and spending intentional time with him to get his perspective on things? I, I found so often through this time, I've needed to reset my mind and my emotions with Jesus. So often I get so flustered of what's going on or angry. And there's times I just need to stop and push the reset button with Christ and tune back into what he wants me to be thinking about and what he wants me to do. And the busier things are, sometimes the more we need him. And even in the busyness, we can be aware of his presence if we're abiding. Because abiding does not mean just a once a day thing. It doesn't mean that we just do a devotional time in the morning or at night. Abiding is we are having a conversation with God all day long. That we're in constant contact with him. If nothing else, we are simply aware of his presence with us. And often talking to him as we go. My favorite prayer that I probably say the most often is, God help. <laughs> I say that multiple times during the day. God help. Are you abiding in Christ. And then let's look at the results of abiding. Okay, so once we're abiding, once we're maintaining that contact with God, 
What will it look like? What will happen in our lives? Well, this passage gives us five results of abiding. The first one we've talked about is you're going to bear fruit. In verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And in verse 18 of the same chapter, it says, this is to my father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's God's desire that we would bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And as we talked about earlier, we can't do this on our own. We have no power to bear fruit on our own. We can only bear fruit if we abide in Christ. And once we do, you will bear fruit for the kingdom of God, both in you and out of you. That in us, as Christ's transformative work, transformative power works in us and our hearts are changed, we'll see that we are much different. And when we are much different, we're going to act much different. We're going to minister to others and draw people to Christ. It is both an inward fruit and an outward fruit. But if we abide, fruit will come. Secondly, we can pray confidently. In verse 7, he says, If you remain in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What this is saying is that we can pray confidently when we pray continually. And praying continually may be just what it looks like to abide in Christ. But when we are abiding in him, we should be praying with confidence, knowing that God will hear us and he will answer us. Now, this verse has been used and abused by a good many people. What this does not mean is that I can ask for whatever I want in my selfish desires and God's going to give it to me. I, I've said this often, God is not your personal vending machine that you can just punch in the right prayer and out pops what you ask for. Um, that's not what this means. Um, he's not going to give you whatever you want, especially when you are asking selfishly. But if we are abiding in Christ, that means our desires are transformed to where we begin to desire the same things that God desires. And when we ask for him to work, desiring the same things that he's desiring, he's going to answer us. He's going to do amazing things. He's not going to say no to something that he wants done and that we want done. So when we're abiding in Christ, the result should be that we pray confidently, knowing that God will move. And I know I'm guilty of this at times, but how many times do we pray We say amen, and deep down we're like, eh, it probably won't, nothing's probably going to happen. Like, eh, you know, maybe he'll do something, maybe he won't. That shouldn't be. When we abide in him, and we are on the same wavelength of Christ, we should have confidence that our prayers will be answered, and that the Spirit of God is going to move if we are praying according to his will. So we should pray confidently. And then thirdly, God is glorified when we abide. In verse 8, he says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. When we abide in Christ and thus bear fruit in Christ, Jesus is glorified by that. One of the things that makes Christians weird, and we are weird, let's face it. Um, As followers of Christ, we're strange. Um, to the world anyway. We're, we're weird. Paul talks about this. He says if we are out of our minds, right? It's, um, one of the things that makes us weird, though, is that we live for the glory of another. We live for the glory of another. I want my life to be lived in a way that Christ is glorified. If there is a legacy that I want to leave behind, it's that Jesus was lifted up with my life. And as Christians, that's one of the desires that we share Our goal, or at least it should be our goal, is not that we ourselves would be glorified, but that Christ would be glorified in us. That we would lift him up, that we would make much of his name. And when we abide in Christ, God is glorified because we become more like him. We can become an extension of who Jesus was as his Holy Spirit changes us and lives his life through us. One of the prayers that I often pray is for the Holy Spirit to live your life in and through me. 
That's what our desire is as Christians, that God would be glorified. And when we abide in him, he is glorified. And fourthly, as we abide, we experience God's love. In verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remained in his love. We all know that God loves us. In fact, for many of us, one of the first songs we ever probably learned was, Jesus loves me. If there's one thing to know um, that the church is good at preaching, it's that Jesus loves you. But you know, it's one thing to, to know he loves you. It's another thing to experience his love. And when we are connected to the vine and walking in fellowship with him and have his power flowing through us, we experience his love. Jesus says, if you abide and obey what I've told you to do, which is part of what abiding means is to obey, then you will remain in my love. You will abide in my love. One of the basic needs of humans is love. We want to love others and we want to be loved by others. And in Christ, those needs are fulfilled and fulfilled more abundantly than we could ever imagine. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. 1 John 4, 16 says, And so we know and rely on the love of God that he has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. When we abide in Christ, we will not just know that he loves us, but we will experience his love. And then, fifthly, we experience true joy. When we abide in Christ, we experience true joy. Verse 11, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now, I don't know about you, but complete joy has always sounded pretty good to me. But that's what happens when we abide in Christ. And we've talked about this recently, that this joy is beyond circumstances. It's a joy that can't be taken away by simply what happens around us. Because if Christ is ruling and reigning in your heart, then there's a joy that transcends everything else. As Christians, we should be the most joyous people on the planet. And it really bothers me when I meet grumpy Christians. It bugs me. Like growing up, did you have that one like old person in your church who just seemed to gripe at everything you did as a kid and that quite frankly scared you a little bit because they were grumpy? Like as a little kid running around the church, like you always avoided that one person because they were always just grumpy at the kids. I mean... I have met people in churches and walked away thinking, where did joy go? Where did the joy go? And I have to admit that lately, I've been pretty bothered by Christians' reaction to this whole virus thing. That so much of what we're presenting to the world is not a great representative of Christ. It's certainly not joyous. It's not very hopeful. But too often we are not reacting any different than the rest of the world around us to what's happening. I don't think that ought to be. We should be joyous in Christ. If you are not experiencing joy in your life, could it be that somewhere along the way you stopped abiding? That your connection to God weakened and with it your source of joy was lost? You can still act like a Christian, speak like a Christian, look like a Christian, without actually being in contact and fellowship with Christ. You can look the part, but I believe that joy is a very good tell for if someone is abiding in Christ or not. I've met people who seem to have no joy at all in their Lord. And I have seen others where it has been absolutely clear that the joy of the Lord was their strength. And who do you want to spend more time with? The people who have lost their joy or the people who are always joyous? 
If we are abiding in Christ, then joy should be part of our lives. That doesn't mean we won't have trials or heartaches or problems or bad days. But in the midst of those, the joy of Christ can remain. And joy is a very contagious thing. I hope you have his joy in you this morning. I've even seen pastors who've gotten to the end of their ministry and they seem angry and cynical and unhappy with how things have turned out. And I think to myself, I don't want to be like that. When I finish the race, when I'm at the end of my ministry, however long that is, I want to be one of those old people that is just hilarious and kids laugh at all the time. Right? I, I don't want to be one of the old people that kids avoid, but if there's one thing that's clear in my old age, I want them to know that the joy of the Lord is in my heart. And if we abide in him, we should have joy. Jesus said, I am the true vine. In an interview a while back, um, Sean Connery, who, let's face it, was the envy of a lot of people for a lot of years. He was tall, handsome. He played James Bond in six films. He was able to travel the world to all sorts of exotic locations. He has been a producer in many movies. But when he was 62, um, they ask, why at this age do you continue to act? Why do you continue to be involved? And this is what he said. He said, because it provides me the opportunity to be someone better and more interesting than I really am. It gives me the opportunity to be someone better and more interesting than I am. I think there's a lot of people who feel like that. They feel that their lives are not all that they could be. And they certainly feel that they're not as good as they should be. They feel something is missing and discover that wealth and power are unable to fill the void in their lives. Because the truth is only Christ can make a person's life what it should be, what they want it to be. And that's been the real message of this I Am series that we've been on the last several weeks. That we've looked at who Christ said that he was. And we have discovered that he is everything. He is everything that matters. He is the source of true life and joy and peace. He's the source of salvation, of hope and forgiveness. He is God in flesh. In short, when Jesus says, I am, he means I am it all. And so as we wrap up this series, I have to ask you, is he your all in all this morning? Is he the source of what you need? Do you believe that Jesus is God and flesh and being so, he is the bread of life, that he is the light of the world, that he is the door of the sheep, that he is the good shepherd, that he is the resurrection and the life, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the true vine. And I think it's a good thing that we ended this series with what we talked about this morning because for him to be all those things in your life, you have to abide in him. We must abide in him. And if we abide in him, we will find that Jesus is all that we ever need and then some. Way centuries before, God said to Moses, I am. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And what he is, is everything we could ever hope and dream for in a Savior. And because he is, we can have true life now and for eternity because he is the great I am. So I could hammer home anything to you this morning, especially in this time of crisis, where life has taken a turn that we were not expecting. Is that no matter what is going on in your life, whatever trial you're facing, whatever your opinions are of this whole thing, first and foremost, we need to look to Christ and stay connected to him. Our hope is not in the government or people or anything like that. At the end of the day, so much of it is beyond our control. But the one thing we truly need 
is Jesus in our lives. We need to look to him. We need to abide and stay connected. We need to take our thoughts, our opinions, our emotions, and bring them to Jesus and allow him to speak. Jesus is the great I am. So seek him above all else, and you will find him everything you need and much, much more. He is I am. Heavenly Father, thank you for being the great I am this morning. And God, once again, wherever we're at, whoever we're with, I pray that you would just speak, that you would move in our midst, that you would bind us together through your spirit. And God, wherever areas of life that we're struggling with, Father, I pray that we would look to you to be our I am. And Father, I pray more than ever, help us to be a good witness to you to the rest of the world. Help us to reflect you. Help us to be joyous. Help us to be beacons of hope. And Father, I thank you for the work that you are doing in our lives. And God, I pray um, that you give us wisdom as we move forward. I pray that we would be able to be back together as your church soon. I pray that, um, God, that the spread of this virus would halt. That you would be with those who are effective. That you would heal those who are sick. And Father, help us to be your people in the midst of all of this. Bless each one. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us again today. Um, once again, look out for uh, emails this week. I'll be updating you. Um, but take care and God bless. I miss you all.